The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Now we are moving to our third presentation of today, and that is beam implantation techniques in the design uh, build mental health project presented by Tom Strong from Elizon Corporation. So I would like to introduce our speaker. Tom Strong is responsible for the strategic development, direction, and management of the Elizon's virtual construction services group. Strong builds alliance relations with technology with business partners and guides the adoption of new innovative solutions to ensure Elizon continues to meet the evolving needs of its clients. Mr. Strong has, a, has been active in the construction industry for about 11 years, working in R&D, construction management, including the projects such as Frank Gehry's Art Gallery of Ontario that's very close to the hotel, and I would recommend uh, everyone to visit the facility. So, Okay, well, thanks, everyone. I uh, appreciate the crowd here. So. I'm filling in for uh, Wazam, who couldn't make it today, so that's why I'm kind of figuring out what's, what's happening. But uh, here's, I'm, I'm Tom Strong. I, I run the virtual construction group at Elliston. We're about 30 people. Um, you're probably familiar with Elliston Construction. We're a big general contractor in the Canadian market. Uh, we do about uh, 3.5 billion in uh, construction per year. Uh, we started um, a group, a virtual construction group, uh, about five years ago. Uh, and our strategy is basically to deploy individuals to do project teams on project sites where uh, they collect 3D models from the consultants if possible and also to collect models uh, as submissions from, subs, from the subcontractors. Uh, so we're using uh, these models very similar to the previous presenter uh, spoke about. We're making sure that all the systems in the building, all the 3D uh, content is fully coordinated before we hit the job site. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of our uh, P3 projects. It's the uh, Waypoint uh, Mental Health uh, Facility, and uh, kind of go over some of the some of the goals around the project, what we did, who participated in the process, uh, and what the what the results were. Uh, so here is just a, a quick uh, fly through of the overall model. Uh, so you can see it's a pretty pretty big project, and we had many different collaborators producing 3D content. Uh, so we were collecting models from uh, Reddit that were developed by the consultants, and we were also collecting models. Uh, from various softwares that were uh, developed by the, the subcontractors, uh, and each party is developing that content for their own purpose. So the you know the subcontractors producing a 3D model so they can manage the production of their shop drawings, or maybe run their CNC machines that's going to fabricate the ductwork, etc. Um, so what we do as a general contractor uh, is we bring all this content together uh, as submissions and, and, and integrate it into uh, Navisworks. So. Very, very similar process to uh, a typical shop drawing submission process, but instead of drawings, we're collecting models. Um, and obviously, there's some challenges around doing that because not all, all the software likes to talk to each other, so we have to work out the, the ins and outs of making that work. Uh, so just a quick overview of the project. Uh, it's a uh, forensic hospital, 312-bed uh, uh, up in uh, Penetang Machine, uh, and it's a, uh, it's a, security, a secure uh, mental health facility, so it actually has a security point component to it. Um, and it was a, um, a P3 design build uh, project, so we're part of the consortium that actually collects, get, goes out and gets the financing and actually uh, helps to run the hospital for a 30-year period. Um, about, uh, the, the total budget was about $474 million, uh, targeting lead gold, and the, the, stru the structure was uh, mostly structural steel, concrete foundations, um, and I'm just going to keep going here. I had a really wonderful, oh, it's going to work. Bit of a uh, 4D model that kind of shows your overall uh, phasing of the project. So 
once we collect all these 3D models at the end of this sort of design process or during the design process, we can take the Primavera schedule and actually link the, each activity to its associated geometry in Navosworks and then we can run a simulation of the project schedule. Uh, and this is very useful to us to explain to all the parties involved with the project uh, what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and when they're going to do it, obviously. Um, we're not maintaining those models when we go into construction, but we're creating them typically at the beginning of the project uh, to il illustrate the, the overall phasing because it's pretty tedious and time consuming to, to keep it current just the way because the models are always changing, the schedule is always changing, uh, so it would almost be a full-time job, but it is useful at the beginning of the project. Uh, so some of the some of the people or some of the companies that were involved with the uh, the project, uh, Canon Design developed the, all the architectural systems and all that content. Uh, Stevenson Engineering did the uh, the structural content, and Heady Ray did the uh, uh, mechanical. And each one of those groups produced models at the design stage that uh, uh, illustrated the design intent, and those models were constantly updated through the design process. Uh, and then once those those systems got locked down, the subtrates uh, started developing their concept content. So uh, Tempcal did all the sheet metal, all the duct work. Uh, uh, Kelsey Mechanical did all the, the piping. Uh, Paul and Douglas did the, their sprinklers in 3D, and then Trestman did the uh, structural steel. So for the most part, all the content uh, at the design stage was produced in Revit. Uh, and then when we, when we move into construction, each one of these different subcontractors is working in a different software. Uh, and you know, the challenge is getting all this, these, uh, these softwares to talk to each other. So we need to set up uh, an execution plan at, at the uh, early stage and make sure that everyone's going to kind of play nice together in 3D. Uh, so some of the challenges with a design build project, obviously, is that the design is constantly evolving through, uh, through the process, and we're involved with that. So we're making sure that as the design uh, emerges that it stays on target, well, which is challenging, obviously. And the same sort of thing happens with the shop drawings and the design build, because we're actually designing and sometimes building the next day. So we have a very short window to make sure that things are going to work before they hit the, uh, the job site. Uh, another challenge on the project was that it was, there were existing conditions we're tying into an existing building, uh, and there's lots of existing services that we need to avoid or tie into. Uh, and then structurally, you know, there's, and mechanically, there are some challenges around making sure that the whole facility uh, was secure. So for example, instead of having like a typical uh, access panel, you might have a very a secure access panel that requires uh, more coordination. A um, bit of a diagram there that shows the overall process. So starting in the top left-hand corner there, the design team would produce their 3D content. Uh, and then amongst themselves, the primary consultant uh, took the lead here. We participated. Uh, but they make sure that all the design content that's being produced is integrated together and, and can work together. Uh, and then obviously out of that process, they produce their 2D CAD files and PDF files that are submitted to us. And we collect those Revit models via an FTP server, and then we integrate that together and feed that to our subcontractors. Uh, and then the subcontractors produce content. We collected that content, integrated it together to make sure that it would work. Uh, we did this on, Na on Navisworks, and at each stage we would identify uh, problems. We uh, you know, coordinate meetings and make sure that uh, all the issues are being tabled so that the, all the parties are aware of the issues so that, that the, uh, the design and, and the coordination constantly improves through this, uh, this stage. So just highlighting a few of the issues that uh, we had to deal with and some of the examples of how we use the 3D modeling. So uh, uh, starting in the, uh, the bottom left-hand corner there, that's the, uh, some of the modeling we did of the shoring. So we actually went in and, uh, and modeled the shoring and the tiebacks to see the relationship, so we could illustrate the relationship in 3D between the tiebacks and, uh, and the foundations of the building. And we actually, by doing that, you know, we uncovered a lot of issues and made sure that uh, the tiebacks were to work before we hit the job site. Um, the top right there is some of the, the existing uh, drainage and mechanical systems that need to be coordinated with the, uh, the foundations. And the bottom right there was a, an existing uh, electrical bank that was uh, on site that we needed to coordinate the structure around. So we actually modeled that in 3D as a placeholder so that as the design evolved we could see how the things were going to be uh, flushing out. Uh, one of the challenges with uh, any design that's fast-tracked and you have multiple parties participating in is uh, making sure there's a pro like enough space for the, the uh, mechanical electrical systems uh, in the building. So you know, obviously, the, the taller a building gets, the, high, the higher the um, uh, floor under, underside of structure to floor height space, the more expensive the building is. So with the idea with these design build projects is always to try to get that as tight as possible to reduce the amount of build, building envelope that you have to pay for. So uh, consequently, you end up trying to compress all these mechanical systems into a very tight uh, above ceiling space. 
So by modeling these systems at the design stage, we can make sure that the appropriate amount of space is allocated for the mechanical systems, uh, as well as you know, we just make sure that it's going to work. So we actually had a lot of coordination between trusses and mechanical systems. Uh, and the models that emerge at the design stage, they're a relatively low level of detail, but enough to show that the systems are going to fit. And then we, we move into construction, those models get pulled out, and the, uh, the subcontractor models get put in. So a few, uh, few examples of the things that we targeted uh, using the 3D systems on the project. So one, uh, we maintained a master model on the project, like similar to how we would maintain uh, a master set of contract documents on the project site. We maintain a master model. Um, and we did constructability um, analysis, making sure that uh, all the systems were to fit together using clash detection. Uh, we were using the models for quantity takeoff, so we could you know, quickly evaluate the quantity or volume of concrete and uh, square footage of curtain wall, et cetera. Uh, then, of course, we were taking in those fabrication models and making sure that they were working with all the other uh, fabrication models. So there's the master model. So this, again, this is, this is many, many different companies collaborating together and bringing all this content into one location. Uh, Elliston did some modeling, uh, just placeholders or things that we didn't get from the subcontractors or you can see some of the, uh, all the peripheral underground systems like the drainage, uh, we, we would model that because there was no other source for it. So uh, that, I mean, that's always the challenge, you've got to fill in the blanks and obviously take a bit of responsibility there. Uh, a few different examples of some of the constructability uh, things that we encountered. So, you know, existing, or sorry, that's a new roadway uh, tying in, I think, with an existing tunnel there on the top left. Uh, so we had some challenges with the ramps, uh, you know, and you'll find this if you, when you're working with BIM coordination that you have challenges uh, coordinating the architectural, um, structural elements and the structural elements in the two models because uh, the architect wants to model them to make sure the architecture works and the structural engineer wants to model the structure to make sure the structure works and you end up getting two models that aren't necessarily coordinated 100%. So it's always better if you can get uh, content from one source, but sometimes it's necessary to have two models floating. Um, the bottom, bottom left-hand corner there, um, the uh, coordination between the structural steel trusses and the, um, uh, the duct work was a particular challenge. We, we actually managed that using uh, um, uh, volumetric uh, placeholders. So we actually modeled the temporary object in the model uh, to, to placehold the space that was needed for the duct work, and then the, the truss was uh, uh, built around that placeholder, and then eventually replaced that with the actual content from the structural steel subs. Uh, and then just m managing the coordination between the structural seal and the ductwork, it's both moving targets, right? Uh, so uh, quantity takeoff, um, some of the things that we, ch we uh, targeted were the interior partitions, uh, very quick to, to grab all the square footages of all the chips and the framing and paint uh, required for the job. Um, we, we actually had to work with the, the consultants to make sure that these models were developed for that purpose so that we could use them for that purpose. Um, obviously doors, ceilings, um, and the, uh, the uh, precast concrete panels on the exterior of the building. Uh, so there are the fabrication models. You can see that there's a difference if you go back, if I go back and look at the, the design models against the fabrication models, much more content. Uh, subcontractors, if they're very sophisticated using these modeling systems, they'll go to a very high level of detail to control the geometry that they intend to bring to the field. So they'll even go to the point where they're going to put in uh, uh, pipe hangers, for example. Uh, there's an example of that. So uh, with a total station, you can actually program in the XYZ point of the intersection between that, that pipe hanger and the, on the underside of the concrete slab. And then when we're doing the form work, they can use a total station to lay out the anchors that, uh, and, and pre-install the anchors for all the, all the pipe hangers. So there's, there is a reason to uh, obviously go to that level of detail. And then, you know, the, the subcontractors have a, uh, an obligation to, uh, to do the, the full, full engineering on all these systems and, and uh, calculate the number of hangers required based on the weight of the pipe or um, uh, stress analysis on the pipe. So the geometry does change from design to uh, uh, subcontractor submission. And here's a, a quick example of some of the design coordination. You know, you get some complexity managing um, many, many different systems around the same zone. So this is a precast building, so those are precast panels on the exterior of the building. We had to have all the uh, the holes cut for the various systems in the exact uh, correct location when the panels came to the job site. And uh, you know, using the three systems, you can actually visual, visualize how these things are going to come together and make sure that they're going to fit, essentially. Um, so there's the, uh, the Trustman uh, structural steel model. Uh, you can see that it's color-coded, uh, broken up by uh, installation phase. Uh, so you can actually see visually how it's going to be installed. Of course, you can link this to, to a schedule as well and play a 4D animation. So we were bringing, we had the original um, structural steel model from um, 
uh, Stevenson, and then we pulled that out and brought in the Tressman uh, Teco model and overlaid that in Navisworks. I'm, I'm, I was given the, the two-minute marker. Um, yeah, we'll just kind of skip along here. There's the, uh, an example of the execution plan. I think this is emerging as a, a standard in the industry. I mean, it's, it's all this, if you're going to get people to collaborate and different companies to collaborate that all have their own standards, it's very important to come together at the beginning of the project to get all the different players on the same page about how you're going to exchange the information and just let people know you're working in these systems, maybe do some testing to make sure the models can come in and out of various systems so that uh, as you go forward, uh, you have a plan that everyone follows and, and things actually dovetail. Um, a couple examples of some of the other coordination issues. So here's, this is a uh, reporting. So at a Navisworks, we produce a PDF report in addition to the Navisworks file that we can com uh, communicate with. And you can see those lines right there. Those are actually the CAD lines uh, from, that were submitted to us by the, uh, the uh, I think it was RES precast, I'm not wrong with that, by the precast uh, um, subcontractor. So we actually took their CAD work and flipped it up and put it on uh, the 3D model and then did coordination between the intersection of all the precast panels with the structural seal so we could identify if the pockets are in, in the correct spot. So a very effective way of uh, coordinating shop drawings is actually bring the 2D shop drawings into the 3D model. Um, we also used the model to, um, to manage our uh, excavations. We actually took all the elevations from the ex uh, excavation plans and all of that in 3D so we could help to communicate uh, all the cut and fill patterns. Uh, there's that example of the electrical duct bank. Some other examples, there's the, uh, that's all the, uh, the case on. So we didn't, we didn't get that model from the subcontractor. We, we took it upon ourselves to model their shop drawings just to do a test to see if that content was going to work, uh, which was uh, actually very helpful. Like, because obviously you can't put uh, tiebacks underneath foundations and there are other rules around that. Uh, so when we initially modeled this based on the shop drawings, we identified a number of issues. We were able to communicate it very, uh, very fast. It's a very short amount of time to produce this model, and we can very quickly eliminate a lot of uh, discussions around getting this right uh, and uh, get right to something that works. Uh, there's that precast uh, CAD work. So we actually took the precast CAD submissions, uh, pulled them out, flipped them up on the building, and then assembled the uh, building envelope with all the, all the cut lines. And then we were able to bring the model into that, obviously overlay, look at and evaluate each elevation to make sure that every single um, window, opening, penetration, uh, foundation wall, et cetera, was fully according with those CAD files. And I mean, that's the, that's the key in this, is, is pulling content from the people that are responsible for doing the site work. Because if we produce the model of, the, of those lines it's, and gave that to the subcontractor, they wouldn't necessarily incorporate that into their work. So it's much more effective to pull their work from them and integrate it into our work and check it. And then we can give them feedback on the, on the stuff that they're producing. And that also in that, they're responsible to make sure that what they do in the field matches their work, right? So it's, it's a much more effective way of working. Um, one of the things that we did was uh, sort of innovative uh, on this project is, I, you know, I, I was looking for the name of this plugin, but I couldn't find it. But um, we always have a challenge with locating the clashes uh, between multi-disciplines in, in the subcontractor's original CAD work. So, you know, if Kelsey Mechanical is producing a pipe, and then we bring that pipe into Navisworks and find a, a clash, it's difficult to communicate that exact location back into Kelsen's CAD system. Uh, so in Navisworks, we actually had this plugin where we could generate a, a three-dimensional object and then send that three-dimensional object back into Kelsen's uh, CAD system so that when they're navigating their model, they can find that clash location, which is tagged with the data telling them what clash it is, so that they, they can quickly correlate uh, the clash in their report against an actual location in their 3D file, right? Because we're going uh, a full cycle there. Uh, I forget the name of the plugin. If somebody wants the name, I could probably dig it up. Just send me an email. Um, so conclusions, right? Good, good time. Okay. Uh, conclusions. Uh, so at the uh, start of the project, obviously, the target is reducing risk. Uh, so we found that we had uh, a more, more productive design meetings because we had the model to facilitate that process. Um, we had the model to help us with uh, facilities management decision making so we could actually see the model and, and explain to uh, Honeywell, who was doing the facilities management, what the building was going to look like and where the systems were going to be. And they could evaluate how they were going to maintain them and, and provide feedback to the designers at an earlier stage. Um, we had a more proactive uh, trade coordination process. I mean, the problems always get solved. The goal of this is to move that problem-solving process uh, 
uh, sooner in, in the project schedule. So we can identify things sooner. There's lots, less cost impact on the back end uh, if we work more proactively, obviously. And that, that, that obviously led to a uh, reduction in RFIs and site instructions and questions on the job site. Anything we can do to be proactive, we want to do to make the job go uh, as smooth as possible. Anyways, that's, that's my 20 minutes. Um, I'm sorry as a challenge to keep the country.